is the first ever NBA in-season tournament. All 30 teams going for one brand new trophy. The stakes are the highest. Only eight teams advance from the group stages. Then it's down to single elimination. It's winner go home. The last four standing will battle it out in Las Vegas, baby. They're going to go all in on the hardwood for season-long bragging rights in the first ever NBA Cup. Hope everyone's feeling lucky. The NBA in-season tournament begins November 3rd on ABC, ESPN, and TNT. Hello and welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello and welcome to today's episode of The Paddock and the Pavilion. On the show today, I will be interviewing Jamie Neald, the conditional jockey from Liverpool who swapped his football boots for riding boots. Don't forget you can download the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify or Stitcher. Give us a rating and let us know what you think of the show so far. I hope you enjoy Jamie's story. Welcome to the Paddock and the Pavilion, Jamie. It's a pleasure, Stephen. Thank you very much. Well, you've got a great story to tell. How are you and how's life been for you since the end of March? Um, I'm very well, you know. Obviously, it's it's been tough for everyone. But look, I was very lucky. I, you know, during the, the kind of whole lockdown thing, I, I was still going to work every day and still had a routine. And everything went as bad as some other people's lives, I suppose. So, yeah, it went too bad. I kept busy. And thankfully, now we're back racing and slowly, hopefully, getting back to normality. So were were you able to see your family when? That was probably the most difficult thing. Obviously, being a lad from Liverpool and now living down south, I was a fair few hours away and um, with the restrictions and whatnot, so weren't able to visit. But look, we did we did the same thing as most other families. We did the Zoom quizzes and we kept in touch with a close knit family. So we had a bit of fun and you know we got through it all together. Good. Now before we move on to your first sporting love which was football i just wanted to ask what was your earliest racing memory oh there was the pro me earliest you know me, me me grandfather was he was horse racing crazy and you know at the the age of probably six years old i was placing lucky 15s on the sofa with him so, <laughs> uh, uh, he had me kind of that way inclined from early days and so you know that would be my earliest memory kind of visiting him and sitting on the sofa and going for the newspaper picking horses out i didn't see any of the winnings eventually but you know <laughs> it was great memories now then let's just get start off then with the football um how soon did you get noticed as being good at football uh, very early really kind of it's probably i was probably kind of nine or ten you know in liverpool everyone you know is either football mad or boxing mad and They'd be kind of scouts from all over the country on Saturday and Sunday leagues, kind of grassroots football. So, you know, I was picked up from by Liverpool at a very early age and probably too early. But, you know, it's it, when Liverpool asks you, no matter what you go there, and you, uh, you enjoy it, you know. And what, what position did you play? Uh, so I kind of I fancy myself as an attacker and kind of the higher level I got, I find myself dropping back and back and back. So <laughs> uh, I end up kind of near the end of my career kind of playing down the left maybe left back and left wing you know and you're an Everton supporter so did that cause you any problems when you're playing for Liverpool Academy not really you know I was a kind of I was Everton crazy and you know I made a deal not to the coaches the light but I wouldn't go out wearing a Liverpool kit unless I had my Everton top underneath you know so <laughs> they weren't happy about that but that was the only way <laughs> to get me playing <laughs> and um when you were at the academy, what did it feel like when you, when they let you go? Ah, uh, I was still relatively young. I was probably early teens, and look, you're heartbroken because you know you think, oh, I'm at Liverpool. This, I'm the next Steven Gerrard. I'm gonna go all the way to the top and all this. But look, you kind of, I went back to playing with my friends and stuff. And after a few months, I, I was loving football again, playing with my friends and with my school and. It went long until I was I was picked up again at Blackburn, so um, it's quite a it's a tough transition for a young kid. But uh, I had good parents and we kept going and we got through it. And then what happened at Blackburn? So I kind of went to Blackburn and you know I had a good a good couple of years there and I just is one of them. Look, when it comes down to it, I probably just weren't good enough. You know, these are the excuses of he's too small and 
he's too weak and things like this. So the bottom line, I probably weren't. I just weren't good enough, you know. But look, I, I experienced some wonderful times, and I don't regret anything, you know. And it's just one of them things, unfortunately. But you must have been disappointed when you were let go by Blackburn, though. Yeah. Yeah, oh, devastated. But um, again, I went back to. I kind of missed some vital years, kind of playing with friends and stuff, and you know, um, they had brilliant times, and I went back and done that, and I kind of went. I tried at the lower levels again, and I think I ended up playing for uh, a local team, Vauxhall Motors. And, um, you know, I, had, I really enjoyed football like kind of that level, but the time would come, I knew I weren't going to make it, and I didn't want to kind of keep clinging on to a dream that weren't going to happen. So, you know, I was straight to the point, lad, and I admitted to myself it weren't going to happen. And, you know, I said I didn't want to do it anymore, and that was that. And next stop, racing. Now, your, your father... There's a well-known National Hunt owner having owned Splash of Ginge. But how did you get into racing? So it was kind of, you know, I tried, I tried my hand in a few different things and it weren't working. And I was kind of, I went off to university and I left after a couple of weeks. And <laughs> it was a bit of a pain in the in the backside to my family. And we were up visiting uh, my father's horses at Twiston Davis's yard. And over a meal, the kind of, the boys, Sammy and... And Willie and Ryan Hatch and stuff, they, they said, you know, it's the right size and a lot of things in football, balance, coordination, things like that, you need to ride horses. And he pointed me in the di- direction of the, the racing school. And, you know, I, I had nothing to lose really. My life weren't going any other way. So I just I t- took the leap, yeah, and thankfully it, it, it worked. Now, the racing school, it's a 14-week course. What was that like? You know, um. Me, my father actually dropped me at the the, the, the gate of the race school and he said, right son, pick it up in two days when you quit this one. So I was kind of, that kind of gave me the fire in my belly to say, you know what, I'm going to do this and I'll prove everyone wrong. And from day one in the, in the racing school, the instructors and the staff and everyone was just, you know, it's a nerve wracking thing to go there. And I knew there'd be people there who who've ridden all their lives and I was going there, never even... I'd barely touched the horse. I think I'd stroked my dad, dad's horse once or twice, and to go there and know the reality was I was going to get in the back of one of these animals. It was it was nerve wracking, but as I say, when I got in there, the instructors and the staff there, it's so well run, and everyone's treated the same whether you've ridden all your life or you were like me. And from kind of the first couple of days, I knew for a fact that this is what I wanted to do, you know. So when you when you went there, had you never sat on a horse before in your life? Never, no, not even. On a holiday, on often, I'd honestly, I'd, I'd, I'd touched my father's horse twice probably. I'd give him a polo or something. I, it was just one of them. It never, it never really crossed my mind until that that night we were having a bit of food. Really, but as I say, it was. I didn't have much else going for me, and that was. I was kind of took a plunge, and thankfully for me, you know, life changed dramatically and for the better. Well, good on you. Um... So when you left the the course, you you went to Andrew Boldins. Did how did you how did that come about? Did you choose yeah, Andrew Boldins? So, or? Yeah, so kind of obviously I had a, a good connection with Sam and Willie Tristan Davis through the my dad had and horses there, and I spoke to the lads and said the racing school have have given me a, a, a kind of it's called a dream sheet where you kind of get to place your your dream yards basically and. The boys straight away said to me, there's no other place you want to be going than Andrew Baldwin's. Um, Willie and Sam had, had both spent time at Andrew's when they were younger and they knew how well run it was at Andrew's. And they had both said, just, you know, do your best to get there. And thankfully for me, I don't know how, I don't know why, but Andrew let me go. And um, it's probably my three years at Andrew's probably, you know, I'd say the best kind of three years of my life. Well, it's an historic yard at uh, Kings Clear, and and was Osin Murphy there as well at the time? Yeah, you know, they were all, I was a, I was a massive horse racing fan, obviously, and I knew all the lads, and you know, from day one I got there, the likes of Osin Murphy, Kieran Schumacher, Bob Hornby, Eddie Greatrex, um, Dave Probert, they were all there, and they were all so welcome, and they, they were knocking on my door my first night there, and you know, we went out for a bit of food down the pub, and give me a good welcoming you know which is very nice of them moving on then to your first ride um reading about this on the 9th of august 2018 in an amateur riders handicap on a horse called white turf at sandown what do you remember about that day yeah i remember um 
Andrew called me in and said he, he you know, there was a horse there that I could ride, and you know, that's what you dream about your first ride, and to have it on, you know, effectively a grade one track, a sand down, a, 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 a massive race, it was an amateur race, obviously, but it's a massive, massive track, and you know, the excitement was electric, and you know, to be fair, I give it an extremely inexperienced ride, but I suppose no one's perfect on the first ride, but um, look, I'm very thankful for Andrew for that, and um, you know, I learned a hell of a lot, and you know, it's definitely a day to remember. It was a lovely course to make your debut, yeah. Exactly, it was, uh, that's like the whole day was special, I kind of I went there with, with Rob Hormy, etc, and I was sat in there with, you know, a few of the best jockeys in the world, and kind of, I was just thinking, how has my life come to this, and it was kind of, a pin, it was a pinchy skin moment, but it was a great day, and you know, one, as I say, I'll never forget. Now, when you left the British Racing School, had you always wanted to be a jump jockey, because you then moved to Harry Whittington's? Well, like obviously, jump racing was what we loved because of slots of dreams, etc. And but the more I was at Andrews, the more I started to fall in love with flat racing. And by the time I was capable enough to to get my license, I was probably a bit too heavy to ride on the flat anyway. So uh, it was a natural thing. I, I got a, a few points of pointers and give it a go, points pointing. And you know, from I loved it. And then it was inevitable that eventually I was I was going to make the switch. You know. And reading up, am I right in saying your second chase was your first first win? <laughs> yeah, yeah? I, mean, I think my first my first chase on the rules was uh, was it Cheltenham, wasn't it? Was, was it, it Cheltenham? Cheltenham? Was yeah, it that's a good Cheltenham. start, isn't it? Yeah, and then yeah, and then we went to Ascot on Grade One Cladden's House Saturday. So you know, the the I got thrown into the deep end. Really, there was no kind of it was either sink or swim. And, Thankfully for me, the the horse gave me a wonderful trip round, and off we went up the straight at Ascot in front of thousands of people, and got the job done. <laughs> well, you were a good price. Uh, you were twenty to one as well, I read. So. Yeah, we were kind of everyone was saying, you know, he, he'd been off a long time. We bought the horse kind of out in Nigel's yard, but he'd come from Willie Mullins and then Nigel, so you know, he he'd been trained hard, and we decided the best thing was, you know, give him a good break, and we give him. We bought him, in, I think, in the May, and we, we planned to run him in maybe the November. And he enjoyed himself a bit too much in, in, in the field that summer, and he was he was kind of fat as a pig. So we thought, you know, we have to get a run into him and shake his belly off. And, you know, even come February, he was still a big horse, and, you know, he seemed to thrive off it, and he was fresh and well, and he went and done the job extremely well. And this was a, a, one of your dad's horses as well. So you're in the splash of gin's colours. Yeah, look, it was great to, again, if someone would have ever told me, you know, I remember watching Splash of Ginge win the best fair at Newbury and I'd never sat on a horse at that point. And if someone would have said, look, kid, in four years' time, you'd be riding winners on a grade on Saturday in these colours, we all would just rolled on the floor laughing. I mean, so for it actually come true, you know, you, sometimes you have to sit back and realise how far you've come and, you know, them days just... And the days to tell your grandkids, you know, I'll never ever forget them, you know. And uh, less than two months later, you're then riding the same horse, Townshend, at the Cheltenham Festival. Exactly, yeah. It's just uh, it's a little bit surreal, really. Um, I remember being down the start in the Ultimate, and I was sat next to Harry Cobden and Brian Carver, and like just the, like you're on the biggest stage in the world, surrounded by the best jockeys in the world. And again, the horse gave me one hell of a spin, and you know. I think it was free out. He was bang there, and I was thinking, Jesus Christ, are we going to actually do this? And like, whether the ground got the better of him that day, or you know, it was just a too classy of a race. We don't know, but you know, I think the horse has got a big one in him, and he'll always be there on the big days. And you know, he's a he's a pleasure to have. He nearly got round. Yeah, you just pulled up near the end, I think. No, we pulled we pulled the blast. You know, we we could have finished, but. In the back of my mind, you know, the next stop was entry, so I didn't want to. I didn't. We weren't gonna finish any. We finished, I don't know, eleventh or something. But there was no need. They also gave me a hell of a spin, and you know, it's my father's horse. So I had the option. I could, I could pull him up, and we'll look after him. We'll go to entry. Unfortunately, with all the pandemic and stuff, we didn't get to entry. But you know, we weren't to know that at the time. No, but was it only a day later when you had a winner at Fakenham? Yeah, so uh, I kind of I rode it, I rode it Cheltenham on the Tuesday, and then my boss Harry sent me to 
Huntingdon on the Wednesday to lead up. <laughs> and then I was back there on the Thursday with St. Calvados. So obviously, I, I was riding St. Calvados every day. And uh, that was another amazing day. And then on the Friday, I went off to Fakenham and rode the winner around Fakenham. So the whole week was a week to remember, really. And another one I'll never forget. Right, another part of the show that we always have is our favourites round. And uh, I just wanted the first one was, it's probably an easy one for you, but to, of all those days racing, what's been your favourite of the, your favourite days racing? No, oh, people ask me that often and, you know, it would be, it would be, we've I've had some amazing days, you know, I've watched, we're so lucky we had Splash of Ginger, watching win a Bethlehem Hill, or watching win a Paddy Power. I've ridden at Cheltenham, I've won at Ascot on a, on a big Saturday and but some of them feelings are amazing, but, you know, I'd say, the winner just probably tops it, you know. But I think the, the day I the day I ride at Aintree, whether it's on a Thursday with under people there or whether it's on, you know, a grand national meeting with all my family and friends that I know will will be there, that'll top it all, you know. Well hopefully you'll get that chance soon. What about your favourite horse? Now is that gonna be Splash of Ginge? But uh... it's a look Splash is we've been so fortunate. He's one in a million horse the things the things he's done, you know and We've met some friends for life and the following he's got and very few and far between, but you know, you gain connections with these horses. But you know, I've got one now at the minute with St. Carl with us, but Splash of Genius, you know, it's gonna take a, a real good one to top in. What about your favourite jockey? Favourite jockey would be um, look I, I grew up watching kind of Paul Carberry and um, I know he's my father's favourite jockey and I admire him, but right now it'd probably be either Sam Tristan Davis or Gavin Sheehan. And your favourite race race course? Favourite race course is definitely Newbury. And why is why is that? Why why do you like Newbury? I just I just love the track, whether it's it's flat racing or whether it's jump racing. There's no hard luck stories around there. You know, we jumps to great fences and always brilliant races. And most of all, it's it's an amazing day out. And I always ask this question of people, their favourite other sport, but in your case, the, your favourite other sport apart from horse racing or football? <laughs> uh, I'm a massive, a massive NFL fan and a, I'm a massive boxing fan, so uh, it'd be a toss up between them two. <laughs> so have you been to, been to some fights as well? Yeah, look, Liverpool is, you know, it's 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 boxing crazy, and I've been to plenty of fights in Liverpool and. I actually went to um, Joshua Parker fight, Andy Joshua versus Josh Parker in Cardiff. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to see some great fights. Now, another exciting development for you in your short racing career is that you're the first ever uh, British Racing School ambassador. What work does that involve? That's right. Um, look, you know, my main goal is to spread the word that, you know, it's po- it, this career is possible for anyone. I'm not. There's nothing special about me to make like to make. I can do it and no one else can. Like I'm just a, a normal kid, you know. Especially in Liverpool, you know, we them big cities. The especially Liverpool, the it's football or boxing. It's and we host the greatest race of all time in the Grand National. Yeah, there's no kind of young Liverpool lads barely in this sport. And if I can go into schools all around the country and show kids that this is a possible career path even if they don't know it yet you know and get kids into this into this wonderful sport and you know that's kind of what it entail and i work with the bishop race you know, to to get into the schools and to show kids this career path you know and is this schools all around the country yeah all around the country you know we'll go wherever we can and it's a wonderful career it's a wonderful life it's it's not really you know it, of course it's a job you get paid for it but you know, if someone's paying you to get up and ride these these horses at uh, ridiculous speeds, and it's and it's just a wonderful life to live. Well, I think you're selling yourself short a bit yourself, uh, Jamie, because you've done fantastic to to get where you are. Uh, but it's a very good message to send out to people living in cities that uh, there are opportunities in racing. Definitely. So well, well done on you there. Um, but what what about your own career ambitions? I know you said you want to ri- ride at um, at Aintree? Look, I'm, I'm a realist, you know, I'm, I'm a level-headed lad and I'm not saying I'm ever going to be a champion jockey or anything near that level, but, you know, I do believe I can mix it at the very top level and I felt like I, I, I proved that, I, you know, 
at Cheltenham, I, I didn't stand out like I was a, a lad having his first ever ride as a conditional at Cheltenham Festival. I felt like I, I rode the race well against the best jockeys in the world. I almost proved to myself that I can mix it at that level. And But look, the end goal is, you know, if I can I win a big one at Angie, then, you know, that'd be dream come true, really. I mean, when you lined up there at Cheltenham, when you got, you know, I see Aidan Coleman and people like that in the race, were you not nervous when you lined up against yeah, them? A lot of people said that to me, but, you know, it, and I always say, and I don't know why, but it's probably the least nervous I've ever been about to race. Really? I don't know why. I just, the whole day, I just was not nervous at all. I don't know whether it was just, um, I was just in a trance that, like, you know, it was the whole, I was just taking the whole day in or what, but I literally just enjoyed the day because I thought, you know, who knows what tomorrow brings? I might never experience this again. And let's just take it all in and enjoy every minute of it. And that's exactly what I did. And I'm so happy I'd done it that way, you know. Oh, good for you. Final question I've got here is um, where are Everton going to finish in the Premier League? Look, I'm not a biased person, but I, I honestly think we're going to go unbeaten. <laughs> and finish <laughs> top. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it may bring me so much joy because my whole family are Liverpool fans and I've had. 20 odd years of teasing me and giving me crap and all this and watching them lift every to- trophy you can win and it's been painful so hopefully Everton can bring me some joy this year. So are you the only one in the family who supports Everton? There's a couple of us spread about but you know we've been hiding for a lot for many years but now we've come out underneath our rocks it's all going well so <laughs> we'll sing and shout until it all goes bad again I suppose. Well you've made a good enough start anyway. Well, thank you very much for joining me on the paddock and the pavilion. Uh, the best of luck for the season and hope you get many more winners and a chance to ride one at Aintree one day. It's been a pleasure, Stephen. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the paddock and the pavilion. You can download the show on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook at The Pad and Pad. Social Podcast Network. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.